Alrighty. Whew, man. My back kind of hurts after standing so long in the same exact spot. What do I do with my hands? Hmm. Man, we should go to Sonic after youth group. That'd be pretty sweet. Man, I hope nobody can hear my voice. Another song, right? If you guys are anything like past Elijah, these might be some of the thoughts that are passing through your minds as we're singing and worshiping, right? But singing and worshiping is such an important part of us gathering at a church, but why do we do it, right? If someone were, if someone were to come up and ask me, why do we worship? I would probably say, well, that's pretty easy. It's because the Bible tells us to. Um, the word says, let the word of God, Christ, or let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Colossians 3.16. Easy enough. We're commanded to do it. But what if you ask me, what actually is worship? Now, sorry if I'm distracting with you guys still getting your Bibles, but, <clears throat> but what, what actually is worship, right? That's a little bit more of a difficult question, right? Like, is it, is it a certain feeling that I get deep inside? Is it a certain state of mind that I get into? Is it singing even when I don't feel like it? Is it some sort of specific action, right? Like, what actually is worship? Well, to find the answer to the solution, let's look to the word for the answers. These are all good questions. And here's my main point for tonight. My main point is worship is simply a natural response through the Holy Spirit to who God is and to what God does. Let me say it one more time. Worship is simply a natural response through the Spirit, correctly, a correct response to who God is and what God does. Let me be clear, when I say natural response, I don't mean everyone here is just gonna naturally praise God left to their own devices, right? We're gonna probably do anything but that. But what I'm saying is, if you love a team, right, and they make it into the championship, and it's a close game, it's back and forth, tied at halftime, and they just barely squeak it out, right? Like, nobody has to tell you to be excited. You're just like, let's go. You know, my team just won, you're telling your friends. It's just a natural response. Or what about when, you're, when a sibling tells you that your mom's making your favorite dessert? Right? Nobody has to tell you, like, oh, hey, here's where you get, like, excited. No, it's just like, let's go. For me, this is rhubarb custard. When my mom tells me she's making this, I'm like, yo, like, I'm so hyped, right? And in a similar way, when the Holy Spirit gradually or suddenly reveals to us just, like, who God is, the natural response is just worship. Nobody has to tell the seraphim in Isaiah 6 to cry, holy, 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 is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They're just responding to what they really see. So in that regard, worship is a natural response to who God is. And the first point is exactly that. We sing and worship because of who our God is. So we worship because God is love and God is good. So think about this. If, if you thought or believed deep down that Man, God actually is pretty apathetic, and I think he actually doesn't really care about me. I think he doesn't actually have any interest in my life. Is that going to affect the way that you come to worship? Right? It's not going to feel very personal. You're going to feel this God doesn't even care about me. But on the flip side, what if you fully believe the truth that God intently cares about you? He knows every single hair on my head right now, which is like crazy. And he listens intently to every single one of my prayers, right? Way back in Genesis, Hagar learns something about God. There's a story where she, Sarah treats her badly and she's kicked out. And then she has a run-in with God. And here's what she learns. That's still true to this day. Genesis 16, 13 says, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. This is, this is our God. This is who we worship someone who pays attention to us, someone who actually cares about me. Like, who would care about me? God does. And again, what if you thought or believed deep down that, man, is God actually 100% good? Is he actually like 100% perfect, right? How do you think that's gonna affect my worship if I don't believe that? I'm gonna come to God and, and could I put my full trust in something that I didn't think was actually good? Like, there's some sort of like secret selfish reason here, God, right? Like that's gonna totally change my view. But what if I believed in the word like 1 John 
1.5 says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Like, this is the God that we worship, and so how we view him, it plays a huge part in how we respond. And we come to church, and we respond, or, and we worship God by responding simply in joyful singing to the fact that this God is totally good and a fully loving God, and that is something to celebrate. That's something to be excited about. And we also worship because God is holy. Now, what does that mean? Holy means set apart. And the truth is that God is nothing like us. He's nothing like you've ever seen, nothing like you've ever experienced. He's so lofty, so glorious, so majestic, so much higher than us, so powerful, so bright, that just, just a mere glance, I feel like, would bring us to our knees, right? You wouldn't come up to this holy God and say, oh, hey, oh, I've heard of you, you know, what's up? It's like, no way. Like, when you come into the presence of this God, it's just like, you, you realize your place and, and his place and his holiness, right? Remember back in Isaiah 6, the seraphim crying, holy, holy, holy? Here's the deal. If, if you saw exactly, if you could see exactly what those seraphim saw, you'd be saying the same exact thing. Praise would just be pouring out of your mouth saying, this God is a great God, and that can be an easy thing to forget, that our God is a holy God. And sometimes we forget that because there's a separation between us and this holy God because we're not holy, we're sinful, and that creates distance, right? Because in that story, the seraphim are responding, and how does Isaiah respond, right? He says, woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts, right? This God is so bright and glorious that even things that we think are just tiny are revealed truly as, as just darkness. And Isaiah is saying, God, not even what I do, but just the things I say are offensive to who you are because you are so holy and lofty. And this is why we come to church and worship our God because God is holy. We should be responding in reverence and awe to the fact that our God is a holy God. We also worship because God is our refuge. That's who he is. You guys know what a lament psalm is? I I guess most of you do. A lament psalm is full of, well, lament, of course, which is despair, sorrow, confusion. And far from being a minority of the psalms, lament psalms actually pepper the book. And in fact, they pepper the whole Bible, showing us that it's actually worship to go to God in times when things are difficult. Let's look at an example. Go ahead and flip with me to Psalm 13. Starting in verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long must my enemies be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Right, notice in the beginning just how downcast he is. Will you hide your face? Will you forget me forever? Will I have sorrow in my heart all the day? Is this true that we can feel like this sometimes? Absolutely. That I just don't get things right now. But by the end, what is the response? David is saying, I'm not just gonna trust in your steadfast love. I'm actually gonna sing to the Lord and I'm even gonna rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because David knows something. David knows that God is our refuge. That even when times are difficult and tough, God is a solid rock to stand on when everything else is falling out from under our feet. God is something that will never fail us. God is is someone that will never forsake us. 
And so the thing is, even, even if I don't feel at this very moment, maybe I'm feeling like there's sorrow in my heart, but even if I don't feel like worshiping and being joyful and happy, I can still worship God by knowing that he is my refuge. Even in these hard times, it, he's not gonna leave me. No matter what I feel like, he's right there and he's always gonna be there for me. And times are gonna be looking up and there will be times when I will be exalted. And I know that. And, and this is just throughout all the Psalms, it's so beautiful to look at them and see that this is actually a huge part of worship too, is taking our hearts to God but then ultimately reminding ourselves of who God is because he's so much greater and he is our refuge. So <clears throat> we come to church and we worship God by responding in humility and thankfulness to the fact that God is our refuge of salvation, of hope, of justice, of love and joy, even when we're surrounded by trials and life is difficult. Now, those are just a couple of examples of why we worship God in response to who he is. There are so many more, such as God's mercy, his grace, his patience. He's the king, he's the creator, he's truth, he's faithful, he's so much more. And there's so much reason to worship God because he is an awesome God. But let's, let's move on to the second point, and that is we worship God not just for who he is, but we also worship in response to what God has done. Now, this happens, uh, this is a theme in the Old Testament. We've seen God doing something for his people and his people responding in rejoicing and in worship. Go ahead and turn with me to Exodus 15. This is called the Song of Moses. Awesome song. Let me set the stage for you guys. So imagine... You've been a slave your entire life. You don't know anything other than slavery. All you know is you wake up, people tell you what to do, you do it, make bricks, make whatever you have to, bad housing, bad food. It's just life, you're just trying to get by, right? And then all of a sudden Moses comes out of nowhere and these 10 plagues come and it's just like rocks your whole world and all of a sudden now you're making a dash into the wilderness. You're making a mad dash for freedom. I could finally be free from this life. But then all of a sudden, trials come, right? Like, my back is up against a wall. We're here up against a sea. There's nowhere to flee. And Pharaoh's army is coming. Like, we're slaves. We don't have any, any, any shields, any swords, anything to defend ourselves. And a whole entire army with chariots and horses is advancing upon us like, this was a mistake. Like, it would have been better if we just stayed there and died. That's what the people are saying, and that's probably what I would have been saying too. And then a miracle happens, and the sea opens up, and the, the ground is dry underneath, and, and the whole people walk through, not one person lost. And then as their captors for life chase them in, the sea swallows them up, and in that moment, like, I'm free. I'm free, there's no more threat. Like, I'm safe and no longer do I have to live as a slave in Egypt. I, I just like try to imagine this moment and like actually being there. That would be crazy, right? And, and what do the people do? Verse one, then, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, right? They sang, do, do you guys think that God had to tell Moses like, hey, after I do this crazy miracle and save you guys, I want you to go ahead and like sing me a song and worship, right? God didn't have to tell them to do that. They're just responding to this awesome event, the only way they know how, and that's singing and worshiping God. Let's go ahead and read this. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the, the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, I will praise him my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts he cast into the sea. His chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. 
In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up, the flood stood in a heap, the depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desires shall have their fill of them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind and the sea covered them and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Man, that is awesome, like that is jam packed with so much good stuff. Like you could like, I feel like spend like hours just like reading through this prayer and just like, man, this is such an awesome display of worship. And what, yes, none of us here have actually experienced this event. None of us here actually walked through the Red Sea, right, and saw this firsthand. But we can still look back and praise God for what he did in, in saving these, his people and how he showed himself to be great. But here's a cool thing is that there actually is something, there actually is a miracle that God has done that applies to our lives just as realistically, just as seriously as this event in the Bible. Turn with me to Romans 5. Starting in verse 6, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, when we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice, worship in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Man, this, this is something to chew on. Like this is something to ponder. This is something to think about. Seriously, and I know that it can, it can feel at sometimes far away and distant, but here's the reality of it is just like the Israelites running out of Egypt, there was a very real threat to their lives as this army is chasing them. When I was born, there was a very real threat, a very real danger to my life, and that was death. From the moment I was born, it, it is inescapable, death is coming, and with that, sin, sin and death, I'm in danger, and maybe I don't even know it, right? But, but I, I am in just as much danger, in fact, actually even more than the Israelites were in that moment when that army was chasing them. And then a miracle happened. What happened? God sent his son to die for us, and so to speak, to, to open up the sea and, and lead us through, and behind us to swallow up sin and death forever. And now we can stand on the other side of that and say, no way. Like, I am free. I'm a free man. I don't, I don't have to worry about the danger of, of death anymore. I don't have to hide in fear, trembling, waiting for it to come. Because I'm free and sin too. Much more than even death, we have reconciliation with God and are saved from the justice and the wrath of God that we rightfully are due. And so just like the Israelites stand on that shore and look out and say, God, thank you, you've saved us. In the same exact way, we look to Jesus and we say, Jesus, man, I was toast if you didn't come and save me back there. And now I am free and I can like live truly. And so we worship and we praise God because and Jesus for what he has done for us because he, it's, it's, he's worthy. Like this is, this is just like the, the craziest thing in all of human history. You couldn't even think of anything more just like mind blowing. And so it, it's something to, to really chew on. 
So, what about me? I understand why the church worships, you know, but how do I personally worship? You might be sitting there thinking like, yeah, this all makes sense to me, but I kind of struggle to get through singing. Like, it makes me uncomfortable. I get bored. I get distracted really easy. It's like I can barely even pay attention to the lyrics on the screen. You know, this is just kind of like something that we do. Well, if, if that's the case, something isn't quite right because God didn't give us worship for it to be a drag and for it to be boring. God is quite the opposite. God gave us worship to be fully delighted and excited and joyful. And even, even when we're maybe not feeling excited and joyful, feeling at rest and at peace when we're going through difficult times in him. So how, how do we actually worship? Let's look to the word for some answers. I'm going to turn a couple pages over to Romans 12, verse 1. Verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All right, so this, this verse gives us a little bit of insight into what worship is. And here, living, being a living sacrifice or being obedient is connected to worship. So worship and obedience have some sort of connection here. Now, think about this. If my actions all week long refuse to acknowledge God as king and refuse to, I'm not going to change any of my actions or my habits, then am I going to be very excited to worship this God on a Sunday? I don't, I don't think so. But on the flip side, if throughout the week, throughout the months, I'm saying, man, this God is worthy enough for me to change my actions and change my habits and for me to obey his commandments then do you, how do you think my heart is gonna to respond to him when I come to him and worship and say, yes, this God is worthy, and I'm, I believe it because I'm actually living it out in my life. Now, am I saying that you have to follow every single command and be perfect by next Sunday to be able to worship? It's like, no way, right? And just as an encouragement, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, from one degree to another. If, if glory is, let's say, 360 degrees, and you're thinking, man, I'm like negative like 270 degrees, I'm just like, I'm so far, like this is gonna take forever, I'm just, I can't, it's like, no. This is the way we all grow and progress. We're all sinful, we're all messed up, and we all grow with little, little steps, keeping our eyes on Christ, and going from one degree of glory to the next. If you're like, man, I'm like the same exact person as last month, but we had actually grew a little bit in this area and I actually like learned more about this area. It's like, praise the Lord, keep going, keep pressing onward, right? It can be a difficult to th thing to do, but continue to strive to grow in obedience. And man, yes, that can be such a tough thing, but don't be a completely stagnant or a regressive person. Is worship a drag? Well, check your obedience and strive to go faithfully from one degree of glory to the next, keeping your eyes on the real glory, which is God. What else? Well, let's turn to John 4. This is a particularly useful passage talking about worship. Look at verse 23 with me. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Okay, so wait. The, the Father is seeking such people, like, okay, I wanna be one of those people and a true worshiper. I don't wanna be a phony worshiper. You know, like, I wanna be a true worshiper, so what do I do? It says worship in spirit and in truth. Let's start with truth. What does it mean for me to worship in truth? Well, it's really quite simple. We only worship things that are true, things are, that are accurate about the physical and, and spiritual world that we live in. Or like if, if we were to worship Mary, the mother of Jesus, would that be worshiping in truth? It's like, no way. Why? Because Mary just simply doesn't deserve 
or, or we aren't commanded to give Mary any of our worship. That's not true. And, and here's another example. What if you worship somebody, or what if you worship God for healing somebody, but if, if that person didn't get healed and maybe suffered, you cursed God? Is that worshiping God in truth? I don't think so. Because the truth is that, well, yes, God sustains our life and God is our health and it's such a blessing and God can heal us. God never promised to heal everyone on this side of heaven, right? And, he, and also God, we don't command God what to do. God doesn't have to fulfill all of the things that we ask. But what do we know? Well, we know that God has promised to give everyone perfect health in the resurrection who believes in him to give us bodies that won't fall apart, and that is something to worship in, right? So do you see how if, if you don't quite understand the truth, your worship can be a little misguided? <clears throat> the point is that we don't just worship in, in, in random philosophies and in blind leaps, but we actually worship in clear, in clear truth. Imagine this, imagine you take somebody, you blindfold them, and you take them out to the beach during a sunset, and you have them turn around and, and close their eyes and you go, wow, man, isn't this beautiful? They're like, oh, I can't see it. And then you're just like, oh, no, just, just imagine it. Like, it's really pretty, I promise. It, it looks beautiful, it's stunning. And like, oh, yeah, I, I bet it does, I bet it is. is. Is this the way we worship God? It's like, no, worshiping God is we're actually turning around, turning to truth, and we're actually seeing truth. We're, actually, we're not imagining God to be this great God. We're not imagining all these great things about God. We're actually learning about him and seeing him for who he is, just like actually turning around and looking at the view and the sun is actually there and the waves are actually breaking across the shore and it's actually a sight to behold, right? And so we, we don't make these blind leaps and pretend that God is something beautiful. We worship in truth, knowing that God actually is something beautiful. So here's my question to you. Do, do you know the truth? Do you know the promises that God has made to you? Do, you? do you know the character and attributes of God? Do you actually do you actually know that God loves you? Do you actually understand that like he cares about you and he's rooting for you? And as we talked about um, earlier with the leaders that he's praying for you like right now, do you, do you know that God has proven himself faithful? Do you know what God has done for you? Because these are beautiful things, and, and if you just knew, you would be worshiping and saying that like God is actually great in truth, and we worship him in truth. So is worship a drag for you? Well, get curious and dig into the word and form some convictions, be strongly strongly have faith in things that are in here and search for the truth and you will find something beautiful. We don't just pretend, right? Like, oh, I bet it is. No, we actually find this truth is beautiful and we worship God in that truth. Now, finally, worship in spirit. This might be the most tricky one and, but also might be pretty helpful. You might be someone who's striving to be obedient and who knows a lot of things about the Bible, but you still don't really like get the deal with worship, right? And this, this might be what you're missing. Um, and to understand what this means, let's go ahead and look at the context. So look back in John 4 and look at verse 20 and 21 with me. It says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So in the context, Jesus is talking about worshiping in specific locations. And what do they do at the specific locations? Well, they do rituals, they do specific actions, right? It's like, it's very systematic. And then Jesus says, there, will, there is coming a day when it'll no longer be like that. And so I think it makes the most sense that worshiping in spirit Jesus is talking about worship that is not just some geological location, it's not just some specific action, but it's actually something that comes truly, authentically from the inside. Right? Worship isn't tied to a specific place. 
Worship isn't tied to a specific feeling, but worship is tied to the truth, right? Praying in humility and thankfulness to God is worshiping. Singing to God joyfully in truth is worshiping. Praising God with wonder at his creation is worshiping. And even happily obeying your parents because God commands it is worshiping. So there... Sorry, let me backtrack. Right, so anything that comes from the inside and is not just a robotic movement, another, another ritual to perform, another thing to do, but it comes from inside. Now, there's a lot of confusion in this day and age about what even is the inside, so to speak, of a person. And I'm not saying that I completely understand it, but I do hope to give a little bit of insight about what the Bible tells us. Now, you probably know that the Bible has said a lot of times that follow the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, to our modern ears, we tend to think of the heart as the center of emotions, the center of my feelings, right? But my mind is the center of my thoughts and the center of my reasons and the center of me thinking, right? Now, does God mean that he just wants us to follow him with our emotions and with our feelings? Well, yes, I think he does, but I think it's way more than that. So back in the day, their, their anatomy was a lot different than ours. And they actually saw the heart as the central organ in the body, just as we see the brain as the central organ in the body today. So the whole body is run by the heart. Um, so, so desires and desires, feelings, but also thoughts and reasoning, I think they would view as coming from the heart. It's coming from what runs you. So here's another way to look at it. I can't see your guys' hearts right now, right? Like they're, they're buried deep inside of you. But I know something. I know that they're beating right now and they're, they're animating you, they're sustaining you, they're making you alive, right? In a similar sense, what else can't I see about you? I can't see your thoughts. I can't see your beliefs. I can't see your convictions. I can't see your desires. I can't see your feelings. Right, and so this whole world, something that is hidden deep inside of you, but nevertheless, I know that it's animating you, it's, it's causing you to do the things that you do, it's giving you life, right? So think of it kind of in, in that way, that your heart keeps you alive and, and, and moving, so what keeps you alive and moving, whether it's your mind, your desires, your beliefs, all of that. So a, as a metaphor, what if I were to do surgery on you, so to speak, and open up your chest cavity and see your heart, what would I see? Would it be godly, a sense of justice built around God's justice, a sense of mercy and grace and forgiveness and love built around what Jesus did at the cross? Would it be a desire for reality and God's truth other over beautiful lies? Would it be strong convictions, a thankful heart for God's actions? a want to follow him, and and, and so much more? Or would it be God-less, as in void of God, where my reality and my worldview is actually something that is just like I've observed. And I think that based on my conclusions, reality is this way, and reality is that way, right? Just completely void, ignoring what God says, and no, like I can understand, I can understand everything, right? or an incapability to to take responsibility for wrong actions. No real desire to have a relationship with Jesus or or any good relationship at all, right? A, a, A dislike or even a hatred for people, a complete lack or care of understanding of of who God is, a complete lack of a fear of the Lord, a complete lack of respect for this holy God, right? and to, to be clear, like we're, we're a mix of, of, of all these things. All of us are a mix and, and we're learning and growing in our sanctification of, of how to change and put off and put on. But it's still important, like are you inside? Is your heart following God or is it following you? God doesn't want just your feelings. He wants every part of you. Jesus designed you as a dynamic intelligent, caring, reasoning, complex, emotional person, and he wants all of that. 
Jesus quotes, in Deuteronomy, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6 in Mark 12, 30, and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength, right? Like all of you. And here's what I think. I think if you went through all of youth group, if you came here every single week for six years and you just learned a ton, but you never once actually thought about Jesus Christ, well, I don't think that you could love, I don't think that you could submit to someone that you never even thought about or considered. It's not something that just happens to you and you feel it, but actually think about, consider, accept Jesus, want to follow Jesus. And yes, the Holy Spirit does touch us and, and, and make us come alive, but I think we do a lot of help in also searching our souls for the truth so that he can open our eyes to that. So I, I hope that this peek inside of what, what it really means to, or what the, the inner person really means is helpful to understand that to worship God needs to come from everything inside, to be informed by truth and to be a true worshiper, worshiping in spirit and truth. If you know truth and you still just like don't feel like worshiping, look inside. Is your spring of life is it centered around you? And are you just peppering Christianity here and there? Like, oh, this will make me feel better here. And this just like seems better. And I'll be better than all these other people if I do this. Or is it actually centered around who God is and what God actually wants for you? So there's, there is a, a huge difference in, in the way that we can think. And the way that we think matters. And when it comes to worship, I think that it begins not with the way we initially feel about God, but it begins with the way we think about God. Let me say that again, when it comes to worship, I don't think it begins with the way we initially feel about God, but it begins with the way we think about him. As an example, if, if I were to fully affirm the truth, to fully believe, okay, I affirm that this God I'm worshiping about saved me from from danger saved me from total destruction at great cost to himself in a loving way. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, whoa, like no way. I, thank you, God. Like I'm a sinner. You're, you're merciful. You're at, I just like, thank you for doing this, right? How could you worship if you didn't actually believe that? How could you be thankful if you didn't actually believe that? So my hope is that you have seen something and that that is that God is worthy of going like, yeah, like God, you are great. God is worthy of our excitement and joy and worship. And if you think that God isn't, well, then you're missing something that I want you to find. Now, of course, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, and, and again, that the Holy Spirit plays such a critical role in this, and we need him to open our eyes to show us who God is. But I think, again, we help him a lot if we're searching in the first place, so look and search for how God is a good and loving God. Look for it. And upon discovering just a degree of how good or how loving God is to you, I, I just, I bet you'll worship. I bet you'll say, no way. Like, I could have, I would have never guessed. Like, this God is actually so loving. This God is actually so good. And again, look to and study what Jesus has done for you. And with the Spirit's help, there is an infinite supply of joy and adoration and worship to be had from this. I don't want you guys to get some sort of idea that being a Christian is a drag and it's tiring and it's boring, because it's not. Because yes, sometimes it's hard. And yes, we do go through trials, but it's a blessing because we serve a truly great God, someone who to get excited about. And, and when we're hurting, someone to go to and to find rest in because he's our refuge. We serve a, a great God, and yet a lot of people don't actually think that he's very great. So he is. Keep looking in truth. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we worship you because you deserve our worship. God, you, Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Most High after what you have accomplished, Lord, for me. God, you saved me even though I deserved, I deserved 
God's wrath. And just thank you, Lord. And God, I just pray that, that the Holy Spirit would be active and that just all, everyone here, the students, would just be able to see who you are, Lord, to see how great, how magnificent, how holy you are, Lord, because we can feel so distant, separated from our sin, Lord. And so I thank you, too, that you are merciful enough to save me from that sin that separates me from you, Lord. And, Lord, we just worship you tonight for being a great God. And I pray that we would just all grow in, in our knowledge of you and our understanding and our, our love for who you are, God, and just look forward to actually meeting you in person one day, Lord, actually seeing you, Jesus, and saying, thank you, thank you. God, you are so great. And I just, I, I pray that at small groups, we would have just times of, of conversation that are just glorifying to you, Lord, and that you would just be the refuge for, Lord, people that are, that are hurting, people that are struggling in this room, and for others that you would just be their source of joy. And I say these things in your holy name. Amen.